Uh, we're very appreciative of Peter and Rama for taking the time today to give an update on Hyperledger Cactus and the Weaver Project and how they foster uh, interoperability within the ecosystem. Uh, so at this point, I will hand it off to Peter and Rama uh, with their presentation. And uh, as David mentioned, you know, we'll be happy to answer any questions. Just feel free to put them in the chat. Um, I'll also be going on the YouTube live stream and, and bringing up any questions that are asked there as well. Uh, floor is yours, both of you. Thank you, Chris. So a very quick note about the agenda. So we have the intro, then we will talk. Me and Rama will keep passing it back and forth with the slides. So we'll talk about interoperability in general. Then we'll have two little lightning talks about the respective projects that we represent, which is Hyperledger Access for me and Hyperledger Labs Weaver for Rama. And then we'll talk about, finally, we'll close out with a sort of collaboration progress update because what we're trying to do is somehow bring the two projects together under the aegis of Hyperledger. And then we'll take questions. So there will be plenty of time for that as well. And a little bit about Hyperledger. It's an organization. So the name has ledger in it, but the word Hyperledger actually stands for a set of projects. And you can find out more about it uh, on the links. And we also have a code of conduct. So please, everyone, uh, try to abide by that. Then uh, there's more information about how it's modular. It's part of the Linux Foundation. And hopefully we can get more people involved. So if you want to get involved with uh, working on open source software, then definitely uh, reach out. And so the two projects, I will not give detailed explanations about what they are uh, because we'll have plenty of slides for that after this. One of them is Cactus and the other one is Beaver. And uh, suffice to say, they're both kind of going in the same direction. Uh, you know, some details are different, but the vision is kind of the same. And so, on the topic of blockchain interoperability, uh, how do we define it? Again, there's going to be more details from Rama about how and what it is, but the way I want to put it is that if you have two different distributed ledger technologies or ledgers deployed, and then you have use cases on those as a business or a person, then you can get a certain amount of value out of using those individually, which uh, on my mini fake equation, it goes as V1 and V2. And then the way I define interoperability in the broadest of terms is that anything that you build Oops. Anything that you build that makes DLT1 and DLT2 somehow work together, producing a value of V3, if that V3 is bigger than the combined value you are getting from the other two DLTs separately, then you have yourself uh, an interoperability use case. And uh, that's very, very like 10,000 feet kind of uh, perspective but I am keeping it simple for now intentionally. And then why do you want interoperability? Uh, three three super, super quick points. You want to address fragmentation, which is a problem, especially for enterprise uh, users who need stability. And then you also want to save developers from reinventing the wheel every single time they have to connect uh, one ledger to another in some way. And then back to you again, the enterprise use cases, you want to lower the risk of adoption because the space right now is producing innovation at such a break breakneck pace that it is, it is risky to get in the sense that the technology you pick today could be obsolete in a couple of years. 
And so we aim to somehow uh, reduce the risk of that as well. And then one more note on fragmentation, just to put it really in terms of numbers. Uh, the number of different ledgers or DLTs that are in existence is growing. And the number of integrations in an ideal case where you want all of them to be able to talk to all the other types, which is the intuitive default. So the number of uh, integrations needed grows quadratically with the number of ledgers, meaning that if you have a hundred different ledgers and you want all of them to understand or be able to communicate with each other, you need 5,000 integration scenarios. And obviously, if you are trying to get something out of the window, some business application or use case, then that seems pretty daunting. And with that, I will hand over to Rama. Thanks, Peter. So <clears throat> just to emphasize the point Peter made a couple of slides ago, if you look at the figure at the right, we have several different uh, network enterprise uh, blockchain or DLT networks available today. And they all solve different purposes. They, uh, the key is they all solve very restricted, uh, a restricted portion of whatever business workflow needs to be run in a particular enterprise sector. Like uh, a network could be devoted to maintaining uh, know your customer records. A network could be devoted to doing processing payments. Uh, another could be managing a trade logistics workflow from uh, tracking uh, the export of uh, goods from one country to another. Another network could be managing insurance contracts or other the non mentioned here like uh, financing and so on. So the thing is, you have all these different networks that have been built on permissioned uh, ledger technology, and they in the real world they cannot afford to remain uh, isolated. Their business processes are inevitably uh, or inextricably interlinked in the real world. So what you have to do is, uh, but still, uh, there, were, there were some reasons, there were good reasons why uh, the members of these networks chose to keep those networks limited and separate from other networks. So we don't want to force networks to be able to, to have to merge uh, uh, and sort of uh, create a super consortium, but rather we want to allow networks to uh, have the chance and the opportunity to interoperate with each other uh, as uh, they need. So that's the point we're trying to make here is that uh, uh, for, given all these networks, uh, we want to enable the seamless flow of data and value across these networks in a manner that preserves the trust and security. Time. So uh, just because uh, we are uh, enabling cross network interoperation does not mean that we would sacrifice the principles of uh, decentralized trust that blockchains themselves were uh, designed to solve in the first place. Uh, this, if we enable such interoperation, we will end up removing network data and value silos. Uh, we will end up scaling uh, all of these small scale blockchains into potentially one super blockchain, but without uh, having to do the uh, administrative and uh, privacy uh, breaking a task of forcing everybody to part of the same consortium. Uh, this improves network effects, increase market sizes, all of the good things you get in the, the business world. Uh, you also uh, can uh, build complex business functionality across networks. So you have smart contracts running on these different platforms. You can, in effect, build a sort of a super smart contract that encompasses different uh, such networks. Uh, next slide, Peter. So uh, if you have been reading the literature on interoperability, different people mean uh, different things when they uh, look at the word. So I'm just referring to a few here and talking about what exactly it is that uh, projects like Cactus and Viewer are trying to do. Uh, at, if you look at pattern one on the top left, there's a view of interoperability that was espoused a few years ago where uh, you can think of uh, different permissioned networks that have, that share a common peer. That peer is managed by some enterprise, which happens to be part of the consortium of network A, network B, as well as network C. So interoperability in the scenario means simply uh, uh, writing some software that will uh, run on the peer that uh, 
uh, orchestrates transactions across different networks and that has access to the data of the different peers. So that's in effect, you're writing some sort of integration software. Uh, that's one view of interoperability. Another view is uh, going in a different direction where look at pattern two, uh, you want um, any uh, blockchain or DLT network to be able to run on heterogeneous uh, environments. Like uh, if you have a peer network, it should not matter if uh, some peers run on IBM SaaS, others run on AWS, others on Oracle Cloud, and some uh, in your, uh, uh, on prem uh, within your enterprise. So you want uh, the blockchain or the DLT software to maintain a consensus over peers, regardless of what hardware and what cloud they're running on. So that's another view of interoperability, very valid view. That's also not what uh, we are aiming for. Uh, what we are aiming for is really the, as I uh, mentioned uh, in the previous slide, and as Peter mentioned earlier, you have two different networks. Just looking at two networks for the moment, uh, you want them to be able to uh, share uh, uh, data and assets with each other, and also allow some kind of complex uh, business workflow to uh, happen across the two networks. That is harnessing the uh, the data and the power of uh, and the uh, that exists in both networks. Can we do that by simply uh, representing a network by a proxy? Now, we, uh, every uh, uh, DLT or every blockchain today uh, offers uh, you the feature to build applications, Hyperledger Fabric, Corda, any uh, uh, Ethereum. You can build some application over the network, right? So can we just have uh, applications that, are, uh, that have access to particular networks, just talk to each other, uh, in effect, uh, uh, in using the same sort of service integration patterns that people are familiar with from the enterprise world. The thing is, uh, then you're reducing a network to a kind of a trusted uh, proxy. The application, a particular application, in effect, acts as a centralized party that represents the network. That violates uh, blockchain principles, violates the principle of de decentralized trust. So what we want is something deeper. Uh, we want to enable two networks to uh, when they interoperate to be able to communicate at a network to network level. That is the groups that are uh, that comprise network A and the groups that comprise network B should be able to uh, connect with each other as groups, uh, not uh, uh, use any sort of a trusted uh, third party, not use any kind of trusted proxies, but be able to uh, reflect that consensus use onto the other network and thereby enable uh, some sort of complex transaction and also share their ledger states with you. And we'll come to details as we talk about uh, the Weaver and the Cactus projects later. Uh, Peter, next slide, please. So interoperability can be viewed uh, as a, uh, the, the different concerns can be viewed in different layers. So if you look at the, this layer diagram, uh, think of uh, the OSI stack for uh, networking. We have this, is sort of uh, like that. Uh, you can think of concerns going from uh, at the bottom, uh, data going over the wire, and you need to. Uh, we need to ensure that uh, uh, two networks are able to communicate uh, over the wire with uh, or delivery guarantees, uh, negotiating a session, and so on. The standard networking. Then, but above that, you start getting to uh, more complexities uh, and more some things that are specific to blockchain or distributed ledger networks as opposed to conventional network. So uh, we we'll, would like to define particular uh, protocols and particular payload formats that are going to be commonly used for two blockchain networks to connect. Further above, uh, we want to be able to communicate uh, semantics of uh, distributed ledger state. So uh, as opposed to uh, a single centralized service or uh, some sort of ERP system that's communicating with a, a remote entity. Uh, we, we we don't just we cannot just have uh, 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 some data structure that is being uh, communicated, uh, request and communicated across the wire. And that that would suffice for conventional networking. Here, in in addition, what you would want is some notion of uh, the the fact that that data reflects the state that has been agreed to by a consensus of, of parties. So in addition to the, the raw data, you'll also need some other, uh, something else along with the data to convey the fact that the endpoint here is a group of parties uh, 
that are that are maintaining shared ledger rather than a single party. That's where the uh, state notion of state and cryptographic proofs and identities comes. In. And about that, we can layer uh, various uh, uh, protocols. Uh, there are different kinds of protocols, and I'll talk about these in the subsequent slides. Uh, further up, uh, when you go past the uh, the actual message communication, uh, we would like to be able to think about standards that enable uh, two networks that are stay, uh, operating on the same domain uh, to be able to interoperate. Uh, there's a standard called GS1, for example, which uh, uh, is attempting to create uh, uh, specifications for all blockchain or DLT networks that are engaged in uh, any part of the trade ecosystem. It could be trade logistics, it could be trade finance, even the payments and so on. Uh, further up, we, uh, there's also concerns about uh, governance. Uh, different networks put up different uh, policies, uh, how they uh, uh, govern their own uh, network, uh, members joining and leaving, uh, what are the update policies for the ledgers and so on. So these uh, these parts are a little more uh, fuzzy at this point, but uh, we, we need to think a bit more about them. But uh, we've just put them here to show that those concerns are going to arise uh, uh, sooner as in later. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, so uh, this diagram simply shows uh, what are the different scopes of uh, interoperability, or what is the uh, uh, what is the spectrum of uh, possibilities that uh, we can achieve if we enable interoperability among networks. If you look at this uh, connection here, uh, think of two different ledgers that are uh, running on the same network. Now, this sort of thing is possible with say Havilage Fabric or Ethereum or uh, Corda. Uh, you, uh, both these ledgers have their own shared truths uh, and they are distinct from each other, right? So interoperability uh, uh, is important even for those two ledgers, even if they're part of the same network. You still need a way for them to uh, share information uh, with some assurance as well as run complex transactions. Similarly, you have a ledger in one network that needs to interoperate with a ledger it's running on a different network, it could run on the same DLT protocol. The DLT protocol here could be, say, Apple Fabric. Well, going from there, you could have, you also want, want the ability to enable ledgers that are running on uh, uh, a network on, say, Apple Fabric to be able to interoperate with uh, uh, a ledger running on network, a different network that's running on, say, Corda or uh, Apple Ledger Base. So, uh, uh, the, so there are different levels of interoperability. Now, when we actually build the mechanisms, it turns out you can build certain common mechanisms that will be applicable to all of these different uh, patterns. So there is uh, uh, so the interoperability model that uh, at least uh, folks like Actus and we are building uh, is quite powerful, as we as we show later. Uh, going to the left here, we we would also like. Uh, uh, a distributed ledger to be interoperable with a non-distributed ledger system, like an ERP system, and uh, and also uh, relying on oracles and so on. And finally, there are vertical concerns like policy and governance, which are a bit more fuzzy at this point, but uh, they'll always arise when uh, you have two different networks that are being operated by two different consortia. That is, uh, the network operators have to determine when they need interoperation, when they will open up their network to interoperation, and when, when they will uh, keep them shut to any outside uh, connections. Uh, in the interest of time, probably move ahead. Uh, Peter, next slide. Yeah, uh, okay, I think this is the last slide before we move into the projects. So what are the unique technical challenges of interoperability? Uh, uh, as I mentioned earlier, you can think of, if you think of the traditional uh, uh, services-based world, uh, it's fairly easy to communicate. If you, as long as you, define a, a protocol and you expose, you have services exposing a particular endpoint using, let's say REST, uh, then you can, uh, you allow uh, uh, independent parties to be interoperable with each other. But in a distributed ledger network scenario, you have our endpoints are multiple parties. So uh, when the, the authority over the, the state that each uh, multi-party governs, lies in a collective and as well as the protocol that is the consensus protocol they employ to ensure the integrity of uh, that state. So there are some rules according to which any state is deemed final and uh, all the honest nodes of that uh, network are going to uh, agree on that, uh, on whether a particular state is final. Uh, 
but now when we want to enable interoperability this uh, uh, th this uh, integrity of this assurance has to be communicated uh, when any uh, transactions happening between two networks uh, or when it, when any data is being uh, communicated from one network to another so when one network consumes state from another it needs to establish the veracity of the state that is being supplied from from one network and that veracity of the state and that veracity has to obey the shared consensus view of the parties that network. so uh, the consensus views of both networks is important has to always play a part when you're talking about uh, two networks interoperating so how do we enable this uh, there's a uh, we will need some notion of proofs and verifications so when any state is being requested for and consumed by another network then uh, that the information or the state has to be accompanied by some proof. Uh, and this proof has to be validated without the uh, the foreign entity having being able to observe the ledger of the source entity. Because uh, remember, these two can be two permission networks. So uh, uh, a node in this network does not is not privy to the blocks of the uh, ledger of this network. So uh, any consumer has to obtain an independently verifiable cryptographic proof of the validity of state. That's really the, the key here. How the nature of this proof, as well as what denotes validity, can take different forms. Uh, then uh, we have to also think about uh, data versus asset. So an asset is uh, you can think of as a, uh, something that has a, uh, a, 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 a single instance. So it it's it's some piece of information that's recorded on the ledger, which moves from place to place. So if it goes from uh, one place to another, or if it changes uh, ownership then uh, it uh, you, you always have just one copy of that rather than uh, making copies wherever you go. Data on the other hand is something that can actually be copied from uh, ledger to ledger. So uh, any, uh, or, or uh, when you're moving it, when you're copying it from one party to another, even uh, on the same ledger. So the notion of data versus asset is important because uh, that impacts what protocol you would use for interoperation. So for example, if you want an asset to move from one ledger to another, It'll have to disappear from the source ledger. Then, if you want to copy data from one ledger to another, you it won't disappear. You just need to copy it. But additionally, you have to provide some assurance that it was valid state. Uh, also, these activities must be coordinated without any sort of central mediator or, uh, or clock. So we do not we cannot assume that the two networks are synchronized. Uh, okay, so these are technical challenges, and now we can go to the uh, project. Uh, details. Let's skip this uh, in the interest of time, Peter, and we can maybe talk about this towards the end. Okay. <clears throat> yeah, so on to the project specific parts. I will say a few words about Cactus, and then Rama will say a few words about uh, Weaver. So the first thing I have to say about Cactus is uh, the safe harbor. It is an incubation status within Hyperledger, which means <clears throat> Excuse me. It means that it is not an active status, meaning there hasn't been a stable 1.0 GA release yet, and therefore it's not considered production ready just yet. We are hoping to get there as soon as possible, but at the same time, I don't want to claim something that simply just isn't yet. So that's why it's important to know this in the beginning. And then what is it? It's a pluggable enterprise grade framework, and uh, it should hopefully make it easier to transact on different ledgers without having to learn all the different ledgers that you, you or your uh, project is dealing with. So it should save time. It should have all those benefits that I outlined in the beginning regarding interoperability. So you can also sort of think about it as an SDK of SDKs because it encompasses or provides access to all these other SDKs that the ledgers usually ship with themselves. And then the position in the hyperledger greenhouse, uh, the greenhouse being the collection of projects that make up hyperledger. So that's where Cactus is. It is under tools, but you could also make an argument that it's uh, a library in the sense that if you're an application developer whose uh, scope on a business application is just to implement a specific feature connecting to a specific ledger or set of ledgers, then 
it will feel much more like just a library, quote unquote. Uh, a few words about the design principles. I'll be very brief. Uh, definitely the most important is secure by default. We're trying to avoid uh, having to deal with situations where the project gets popular, everyone deploys it, and then uh, issues start to come up where the insecure or non-secure defaults are causing people to have data breaches or any sort of uh, attacks that we enable them on them. So that's that's by far the most important. And after that comes the plugin architecture, which in my personal opinion is the coolest thing. We're trying to maximize the flexibility of the framework, try to make it future proof so that even if uh, the DLT landscape changes over time, we can adapt instead of just being obsolete with the older technologies that would be no longer in use. And then the other important thing to say is that it's toll free, meaning there's no built in mechanism to charge for the usage. There are no gas fees, transaction fees. There's no bidding mechanism there. There is no cryptocurrency involved with Cactus itself whatsoever. Obviously, if you want to implement something that, if that is your use case to do something like that, then you can make Cactus part of that, but Cactus itself does not uh, do any of that so that it's properly open source and uh, easy to deploy. And then that leads me to the low impact deployment, which means Ideally, you can deploy Cactus without having to do any sort of special modifications to the distributed ledgers that you're already running in production, if you have any. A few additional design principles, uh, wide support, which means that we don't want to just cherry pick the most popular ledger technologies to support we would prefer if uh, a good chunk, like 90, 95% of them were supported. Obviously, there's an insane amount of uh, development resources required for this, but this is where the plugin architecture comes in. And I'll talk more about the governance later, but for now, I'll just say that uh, anyone anywhere can create a plugin for Cactus that adds support for any ledger that is not currently in the officially supported list of ledgers. So what we are hoping to do there is to leverage the open source community growth around the project. And then prevent double spending where applicable. This is uh, important to say because people have expectations regarding what they can and cannot do. And I always have to highlight that there are public permissionless ledgers out there who do not have transaction finality guaranteed in the sense that, for example, they, they will deal with proof of work as the consensus algorithm. And uh, there's always the possibility of a fork, although the probability of it is decreasing over time, but technically it's always possible. And so, Cactus is not a magic bullet in the sense that if you are doing some sort of uh, transaction between two ledgers and one of them is public and permissionless and the other one, let's say, is permissioned and is completely under you or a consortium you're a member of, uh, I mean, the control of you or the consortium you're a member of, then there could be a situation where the public permissionless ledger forks and somehow you end up either being out of the money or uh, someone ends up double spending. And then uh, preserving ledger features means that opting to use Cactus should not limit you in the things you can do with the ledgers. If, if the ledgers you chose for your technology stack have some exotic cool features that no other ledger has. 
then you should still be able to leverage those in your application. Finally, horizontal scalability, which means that we work very hard on the architectural design of the Cactus API server to make sure that you can deploy any number of them in a cluster in an O2 scaling group or any other structure that your cloud provider allows for. And then uh, if, you, if you want to read more about these and the use case ideas we have, please visit the white paper that I linked below. And then on to our architecture decisions. Uh, yes, so the project Cactus itself, it is mostly written in TypeScript. We do bundling with Webpack because hopefully in the future we'll link, wait, sorry, someone's asking for the link to the white paper. Okay, let me just go back. So it is here. Oh no, sorry, I'll, I cannot copy it right now, but I'll share it afterwards. I'll upload the slides and then you will have the link as well. So back onto the bundling with Webpack. Uh, we want that because we want to lower the barrier of entry. We want to be able to deploy Cactus in resource constrained environments, maybe even cloud functions or Lambda functions, depend, the name depends on your favorite cloud provider. And we use Lerna plus Yarn to manage a mono repo, which is the backbone of the plugin architecture, meaning that there's separate packages within the same Git repository, which will, allows us to quickly add new ones and to have code sharing uh, between the back end and the front end. So we have packages that are cross platform and universal, meaning that they run the same way, uh, both in Node.js and in the browser. And then the other big decision we have is to focus a lot on test automation. We have dozens of end to end tests that pull up a pristine ledger for our supported ledgers, such as Corda, Fabric, Core, and Bezu, uh, Iroha, et cetera. So we have tests where pristine ledgers are being pulled up from containers, and then the Cactus Connector plugins are being verified against those actual ledgers instead of just uh, doing mocking or, or stubbing or any other unit testing strategy, which is still good and has value, but it's not as uh, sure of a thing as you actually testing your code against a real ledger. And then just one more note on the plugin architecture. Uh, we don't know the future. We don't know what ledgers are going to, to be popular a year from now. We don't know if a new one's going to come along, current ones deprecated, et cetera. So that's why we have the plugin architecture where we hope to be able to respond to these changes as time passes. So we are just basically in it for the long haul. And then what I promised a few slides earlier regarding the governance model, I want to hash this out, especially because this is important. If you want to add support for a new ledger for Cactus, you can just write a plugin. You don't even need to put that code in the Cactus repository, you can host it on your own and you can maintain it on your own. So there's no need for you to get any sort of permission from the Cactus maintainers if you don't want to. The pros and cons are there for you to weigh and uh, there's complete flexibility if you'd rather have it in the central Cactus repository then that's also good, but then you have to go for the review process, which is not as bad as it sounds. And with that said, I'll pass it back to Rama, who will give us a similar quick intro about Beaver. Uh, should I share my screen? I think I'll go faster then. Oh, uh, you can, but I'm happy to just keep pressing the slides when you tell me. Okay, sure. Next slide, please. 
So before I talk about the system, uh, the way we began uh, when we were thinking about what to build for an interoperability platform was what are the categories of use cases we want to satisfy? And we call them interoperability modes here. And there are three of them, asset transfers, asset exchange, data transfers. And between these, we believe they cover the all the spectrum of uh, uh, cross-network transactions that you would like. And I'll show them through examples. So next slide, Peter. So asset transfer is uh, indicated by the model you see in the top diagram here. You have two networks and there's a party in network A which wishes to uh, give an asset to uh, party network B. So in the beginning, you have asset owned by X and A and Y and B does not have it. And at the end at the end of the transaction, you're going to have the asset owned by Y and X does not own that asset anymore. Uh, an example you can see at the bottom, you can have two different retail uh, central bank digital currency networks. And uh, if you have different banks that are uh, uh, on different networks, uh, a bank may want to transfer uh, digital currency from its account in one network to uh, that of an account of uh, another commercial bank on the other network. So that's the scenario. That's an example of the scenario we were talking about here. Next slide. Asset exchange is uh, related to asset transfer. Uh, there, something has to happen atomically in both networks, just like an asset transfer. Uh, but uh, this does not involve an asset actually moving across network boundaries. So if you look at the diagram at the top, uh, you, have a, you have two parties, uh, X and Y, that uh, uh, are members of two different networks, A and B. Uh, X owns asset M in network A and Y owns asset N in network B. And at the end of this exchange, what you want is the assets to interchange hands. So Y ends up owning M in network A and X ends up owning N in network B. Uh, Key is this has to happen atomically. So uh, despite the fact that the two networks do not have any centralized coordinator, do not have any central clock, you want uh, both networks to, uh, you want the asset to exchange hands in assets to exchange hands in both networks or neither of those exchanges to happen. So the, as an example, you can see the, uh, at the bottom, uh, consider a network on the left, which is managing uh, bonds on its ledger for different uh, commercial banks. And on the right, you have a, uh, different banks that maintain uh, currency accounts uh, on a central bank digital currency network. Uh, you, uh, an example of uh, this, of asset exchange is a delivery versus payment where uh, a bond gets uh, uh, issued by uh, one bank to another in one network in exchange for a payment in the other direction in the other network. Uh, next slide. I see this is data transfer or, or sharing. As I mentioned uh, a short while ago, data is uh, different from asset in that uh, data is just some state information that's agreed to by the parties, uh, the stakeholders of a ledger, uh, which of which copies can be made. Now that the data can actually be important in driving forward the business process or, or the smart contract in a given network. So uh, this is uh, uh, the uh, the example below conveys this. It is a rather complicated uh, workflow, but let me try to simplify this. Think of, uh, you have a trade finance network on the left, and you have a trade logistics network on the right. What is the trade finance network doing? Here, it's processing a, a what's called a letter of credit, which is an instrument in the, uh, in, in, the in the trading world and the banking world, whereby uh, a, 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 an importer, uh, uh, the bank of, an, uh, of someone who's importing goods, uh, will promise a uh, seller that if the seller uh, ships certain goods and shows proof, documentary proof that the goods have been dispatched by a carrier, then uh, the bank is uh, obligated to make a payment. So the reason for having this uh, letter of credit is because uh, of the inherent mistrust between the seller and the buyer, so or the importer and the exporter. Because if, uh, let's say, the exporter ships the goods, uh, there's no guarantee. Uh, you get the payment, and if the on the other hand, if the importer uh, makes the payment first, he has no guarantee of getting goods. So uh, that's what the network on the left is doing, the trade finance network. The network on the right, trade logistics network, is managing uh, the the shipment, it's tracking the shipping. Uh, so you have a seller who's uh, uh, dispatching goods via carrier. So uh, what's happening in this network is that uh, 
uh, you have uh, uh, once the goods are dispatched a document called a bill of lading gets uh, recorded on the on that ledger on the on the network on the right now that uh, if that bill of lading were to be uh, shared with the trade finance network then the trade finance network could uh, uh, enforce the payment obligation from the buyer's bank to the seller or uh, actually to the seller's bank so uh, today when these two networks are distinct and separate uh, we need some sort of a trusted intermediary and usually that will be the seller but then the seller is an interested party uh, seller has an incentive to uh, dissemble about the nature of a bill of lading so uh, if if we have if we can uh, build a connection or a data sharing pipeline between two networks uh, whereby uh, a document like the bill of lading can be shared with uh, assurance then that makes the cross network transactions uh, trustworthy uh, next slide peter so we began uh, when you building we were we had several different principles so uh, unlike uh, several systems that existed at that time like uh, i mentioned a couple of names cosmos and polka dot also a uh, uh, system like ethereum plasma which uh, which are trying to uh, uh, build a common uh, uh, relay network uh, that would uh, enable uh, settlement among different side networks or different side chains so uh, you have a common infrastructure which is itself built on uh, blockchain principles which is mediating interaction between two different networks that is a common approach to interoperability we wanted to step away from that and instead avoid such reliance and uh, that led to our uh, various design principles so one of them is inclusiveness we uh, we want to avoid approaches that are specific to any particular dlt uh, we you can uh, if your networks are running on fabric or sawtooth or corda it should not matter uh, the interoperable networks must retain sovereignty on the processes as well as the rules by which they uh, govern access so uh, we, we do not want uh, so networks should be able to determine when and how they interoperate with another uh, minimal trust footprint of course standard security principle uh, privacy by design that is uh, the any interaction between the uh, parties belonging to two different networks should be private and confidential and only the interested parties should have should be privy to it uh no intermediaries uh, we do not want any sort of a trusted intermediary nor do we want to rely on trusted infrastructure now as it happens we in a, in the viva project we do uh, rely on some trusted identity infrastructure in order to facilitate transactions but not uh, we do not rely on any infrastructure for the actual uh, settlements uh we believe that these uh, this that constitutes a minimal set of requirements uh, that will facilitate adoption Uh, uh and and it will be applicable to interoperability in different contexts next slide please so uh the diagram at the left kind of looks complicated but if you look at it uh, at uh, from the high level you have three networks uh, what uh, weaver offers is an ability for these three networks to be able to run uh, any kind of uh, interoperation protocol uh, that is uh, drawn from the three use cases that i talked about or the three modes asset transfer data transfer and asset exchange and the uh, the mediating entity or uh, you can call it a gateway for uh, a network to be able to interoperate with another is what is a component that we call the relay it's a service that uh, every network uh, owns and uh, exposes to the outside world uh, so what the left diagram is showing is simply the different configurations by which uh, uh, networks can interoperate via these relays Uh, and also uh, with existing ERP systems, and uh, if you look at the bottom, we have decentralized identity registries. Those are also a key part of uh, how you would engineer any sort of cross-network uh, interaction. Uh, if you have time to talk about that in Q and A, I'll do that. But otherwise, I'll skip it for now. Uh, for every protocol here, and uh, that is be data transfer, asset exchange, or asset transfer, there are concerns that. Uh, Uh, we'll have to manage at different layers of the stack as we defined them uh, in the uh, earlier in the presentation next slide so what does this relay look like now the relay, uh, relay is built uh, in the form of uh, using a microservice architecture and uh, this module actually is uh, uh, very similar in uh, scope objectives uh, and function to the cactus connector and uh, peter will talk towards the end about how this uh, he's uh, at present trying to integrate the uh, weaver relay with the cactus connector so 
the relay has two different parts. It has a network, a DLT independent part and a DLT, DLT specific part. So that's left and the right uh, respectively. Uh, what the what does the relay do now? Uh, because as you can see in the at the left, relays have to talk to each other. So they have to talk some sort of protocol, right? So this protocol we want to be network neutral. It should not be uh, tied to any particular DLT. Uh, it should not have anything to do with Fabric or Corda or Sawtooth or Bezu or so on. Uh, but then internally, when you have uh, uh, two networks that are trying to uh, communicate instructions or communicate requests for state to each other, there has to be some DLT specific component that can reach to the peers and uh, either run a smart contract transaction or uh, look up some ledger data. So that's what the uh, boxes on the right are showing. So these are uh, pluggable uh, modules, we call them drivers, and they are uh, specific to the particular uh, DLT. So uh, for any uh, network, what you would need to do to make it weaver enabled and interoperation ready is uh, deploy a uh, a common relay, which uh, does not have anything to do with that particular uh, DLT stack. And then you also plug in a driver, which is specific to that particular DLT. So at present, we have drivers built for, we have the common relay component built, and we also have uh, drivers built for Fabric and Corda. We are working on one for Bezu, uh, hopefully one will be ready by end of the year or early next year. Next slide. So the relay, if you're wondering, can be deployed in several different ways. Now, uh, this is actually an important concern when it comes to network administration. Uh, so uh, you have, a, uh, so I'm just going to show you how we envision this happening in Fabric. So a relay can uh, be uh, issued because a relay has to reach the network, right? So it needs to have some credentials to be able to access the uh, the peers, to be able to access ledger content. Uh, so in the in model A, relay can be issued credentials by uh, one particular organization. So if you know Hyperledger Fabric, uh, your network is uh, classified into several different organizations, which are the fundamental uh, units or, or the members of that network. So any of the network can uh, build a relay and uh, uh, offer it to the network or, or issue credentials to that relay and offer it to the network. The reason this model works is because our relay is a trustless service. It does not actually matter which organization it belongs to. It will be, uh, uh, if we don't trust it for anything other than availability. Uh, the relay similarly, in, again, as model B shows can be part of the ordering service organization and uh, or uh, as model C shows can be its own organization. Because of this trustless nature, doesn't really matter how you organize this. And similarly, we can uh, deploy and we have examples for uh, Corda network as well, where a relay can be affiliated with uh, a particular uh, Corda node, which is one of the primary members of the network, or it can be its own separate uh, node, or it could be even associated with the notary, for example. Uh, next slide. Okay, uh, this again is a rather busy diagram. Uh, I'm just going to, this just serves to illustrate what uh, the data sharing protocol that I talked about. So without going into details, what you have on both sides, you can see there are certain common modules there. That is uh, on the, if you see at the leftmost uh, end, you have SDK and libraries in, in, the, in a Corda network. And then in the middle, you see you have certain contracts. And then at the right, you see you have relay and a driver. Similarly, on the network at the right, you have, a, which is a fabric representative of fabric network, you have a relay and a driver, and then you have a SDK in libraries that are used by the fabric uh, client applications. And then you also have a, what we call system contacts. Now that's not to be confused with the fabric system chain code. Uh, what we mean by that is uh, these are common contracts that are that you would uh, deploy on uh, all the peers of your system, uh, in effect acting as library functions. And uh, the steps of the protocol, which are simply uh, talking about how uh, a client in one network can make a request for uh, uh, data, which is that is state of another network, and also provide a verification policy that tells other network what are the standards of proof it's going to accept. And it's up to the other network. Uh, really, it's triggered by the driver on the on the network, which will uh, uh, invoke uh, system contracts as well as the uh, application contracts indirectly, and it will collect the data as well as the proof return it to the client on the uh, requesting network, which will then 
configure a uh, smart contract transaction in the Gordon network, it's a, it's a flow. And uh, that can independently verify the, uh, the proof against the verification policy and uh, update its registry. So this is a quite a complicated protocol, which, uh, uh, but uh, at its heart, it's a request response protocol. It's just that at the endpoints, particular things are happening via consensus. On the uh, source network, that's the network that's providing the data, the right network uh, on the right hand in this case, uh, there, uh, there are access control rules being run uh, to determine whether the request should be satisfied by consensus because they're being run on the different peers and the data is being then uh, provided with endorsements or signatures. And uh, on the network on the left, the proof is again independently validated by the different uh, nodes of the Corda network uh, within the flow uh, to ensure that the uh, state is actually valid. How do they do this independent validation? That actually depends on some identity management uh, or the sharing of uh, the root and the intermediate CA certificates. Okay, so that's part that we haven't talked about here. Again, uh, we uh, there are more details on the on our project RFCs as well as. Uh, there's a paper that uh, talks about it uh, if you go to our website. Next slide. Uh, let's skip this for the interest of time and uh, move to the last next slide period. Yeah, so uh, just this is a snapshot of uh, what the capabilities we have and are building uh, at this time. So the modules refer to different uh, services as well as different libraries. Uh, the protocols refer to the, the three interoperability modes that I talked about in the beginning, data transfer, asset exchange, asset transfer. So looking at the modules first, we are building these DLT agnostic relays as well as DLT specific drivers. Uh, then we are building these DLT specific uh, contracts, what, what uh, you saw as system contracts in the uh, two sites before. Uh, and these manage uh, proofs, these do asset lock management uh, because we are also running an uh, hash time lock contract to affect asset exchanges, as well as uh, associated SDKs for use by uh, any uh, Corda uh, distributed application in a, in a Corda network or a Fabric client application in, in Fabric. Uh, we're also working on uh, Hyperledger Pezu as well of that. Uh, then there is a decentralized identity management, which uh, don't have time to go into right now, but we have, if you go to our projects RFC, you see a list of uh, specification on that. Um, we have a relay, we have a, a support built for data transfer for Fabric and Corda. Bezu not, is not done yet. Uh, for asset uh, transfer is a protocol that relies on data transfer. That's re it relies on the ability to request for data and uh, validate the uh, state along with proof. Uh, asset exchange is a protocol that's built on the common hash time lock mechanism, which uh, uh, most of you may be uh, aware of. And uh, again, that's uh, present supported for Fabric and Corda and it's in the works of Bezu. Uh, yeah, so the, the ticks mean that uh, that particular module or that particular feature has been completed. The uh, orange dot refers to something that's going on. The gray dot refers to something that's not done yet, uh, that's not being actively worked on now, but will be in the future. Okay, uh, I think, uh, Peter, uh, back to you. Thank you, Rama. Now we will talk about how we are trying to get the two projects together. Uh, yes. Oh, wait, Robert, this is still your slide. <laughs> you can go ahead and talk to it, uh, Peter. So, yeah. All right. Yeah, so the common goal is to join forces between the two projects because there's strength in numbers and uh, there's no point in uh, doing the same thing multiple times if we can instead just uh, make some of those things once and make it better because we had more resources to develop it. That's kind of the broad vision. And uh, Timeline wise, you know, I'm always very careful to give any sort of estimates because everything always takes much longer than we thought it would. But it would be great to have something uh, tangible in the first half of 2022 next year. And then we would, uh, the idea is that we would merge some parts of the project. We would take it step by step. It wouldn't be a big uh, 
one size fits all kind of one off operation but instead we would gradually ramp it up and uh, get it better over time and then the important bit is that we would welcome beaver maintainers into cactus as cactus maintainers so obviously the the reason why i'm saying that is important because it's not some sort of uh, takeover or anything it is meant to be legitimately a joining forces on good terms and equal terms, and everyone should have a voice in the governance of the project going forward. And then uh, development efforts by cactus maintainers. Well, that's mostly uh, regarding protocols and technical mechanisms that we need to adjust in cactus to make it possible, but I'll talk more about that later. And then the goal for the common framework together is to cover all interoperability modes or use cases, meaning that uh, if you read any sort of interoperability paper that summarizes the different modes, or if you just uh, look back at the ones that we talked about now, we would ideally be able to cover all of those because it would be flexible enough. And with us joining forces, it would have more resources to actually support all of those because we're talking about a lot of work. And then the merge framework would look like it would have a common code base, but it would be divided into packages. And I have ideas about how we could uh, leverage GitHub's code owners feature for this, which means that you can mark each file or each directory within the source tree as being owned by certain maintainers. And this way we could uh, divide up the work efficiently as in we could uh, sort of have little patches of the code that are maintained by person A and other patches of the code that are maintained by person B. And so the challenges uh, that first and foremost is that there's different programming languages that the two projects use. Cactus is written in TypeScript, Weaver the, re the Viva Relay is written in Rust. Obviously, drivers for the ledgers have to be sometimes written in different languages that the ledger itself mandates. But here in this context, when I mean Viva, I mostly mean the Viva Relay for now. So that's written in Rust. And then there's also runtime incompatibilities of the APIs, such as right now, if you take uh, the Viva Relay, even if it was written in TypeScript, it wouldn't uh, adhere to the Cactus plugin API surface in the sense that you could not load it into the API server as a plugin module. And so the solutions to this that we've come up with, uh, one, use WebAssembly as a command, quote unquote, bytecode. And I say, quote unquote, because WebAssembly is not called, as far as I know, as a bytecode, but I imagine a lot of people who are familiar with the Java bytecode and the .NET common language runtime bytecode, uh, they know how to associate this word with the context. Basically, you can compile down to this common language or instruction set and then uh, have different programming languages actually work together if they both support it. And then for the runtime incompatibility, what we will allow there is to make it possible to have the coexisting implementations within the project through the plugin architecture which means that 
just because there's a different or a slightly different implementation of something, it either uses a different algorithm or a different uh, trust model. It doesn't mean that that and the ideas that are already in the project cannot coexist. And what this allows users or consumers of the framework at the end is that you can pick and choose your trade-offs because in technology or pretty much anywhere in life, it'll, something, a decision that you make, it always comes with trade-offs. And uh, the best we can do is to give you the option to choose which trade-offs you want so that uh, you're not forced into a specific one. And a little more about WebAssembly, uh, just in case you haven't heard of it or you're just not sure what it is. It's a web standard and it is a binary instruction format for a stack-based virtual machine. Again, that doesn't matter much. The, the big news here is that it has shipped and it is supported by four major browser, browser engines, the big ones. And uh, if you have been in the industry for a while, then you know that this is some very, very special thing to achieve for any kind of standard or technology because uh, a lot of new things that come out in the web space are not like that at all, unfortunately. And so a little more about how we will achieve that. What I've been looking into <clears throat> and made some uh, really good headway personally is to compile Rust code down into WebAssembly with this tool called Wasm Pack, which uh, at the end of the day, it's an extension to Rust's built-in build tool called Cargo. And it gives you a lot of really, really helpful project templates for setting up a Rust project that you can pretty much out of the box compile down to WebAssembly. And it has useful components to deal with the lower level mechanical differences between the JavaScript environment and the Rust language runtime, meaning that it has language primitives, not language primitives, sorry, language uh, components that allow you to write an async Rust function that actually returns a promise to the JavaScript layer. So this way there's a, there's a much, much closer working together between the two runtimes. And then the other thing it can do, which is great, is <clears throat> support serialization and deserialization into actual types. So if you have a class in JavaScript uh, or ECMAScript 6, however you want to call it, if you have a class in there, you can pass that into Rust and have it automatically convert into, <clears throat> sorry, excuse me, have it convert automatically into a struct in Rust, which is sort of the equivalent of a JavaScript class, but not really, uh, but it's as close as I can get. And then the, what, it, what this boils down to is that you can uh, compile down TypeScript to JavaScript. You can load that as a plugin into the Cactus API server, which is a Node.js process. And you can compile down Rust to WebAssembly and then also load that as a module into the Cactus API server. And this way uh, for the TypeScript code and for the Rust code, it's basically transparent if that method that they're calling at one time is actually being implemented in TypeScript or Rust. And uh, for now, this has only been proved for Rust, but in the future, we can, <clears throat> of course, foresee this uh, happening to other languages. I know that Go also has a target for Vasm. Uh, so does Kotlin. So the possibilities here are endless. And, and this is why I'm very excited about WebAssembly. And that's why I'm 
mentioning it so much because it's the cornerstone of being able to do collaborations like this. And standardization perspectives. I'll just skip this slide because we're running short on time. And we have some uh, reference materials here about standardization efforts in case someone wants to do a lot more reading and a lot more research, then there's a really good initiatives out there. There's a lot of people doing a lot of really good work in this space, especially within the IETF working group and the ISO. So please feel free to look these up as well. And then if you want to get involved with Hyperledger at large, because there's a lot of other projects there, not just the two that we introduced here today, then uh, here's a few links. Uh, you can, you're very encouraged to go to the YouTube channel of Hyperledger as well, where there's very, very helpful, very short guides about how to get involved on different levels, depending on what is it that you're interested in. And then I'll hand it off to questions from the audience. Thanks a lot, both of you. Um, looking at the questions right now, um, how fast does it transfer across ledgers? How fast is the transfer across ledgers? Yeah. Well, for any, uh, go on, Peter. Okay, so for Cactus, we don't have any published benchmarks yet, but we aim to have them published and in a way so that you can reproduce them. But I can share the design principle around this, which is that we want to make sure that Cactus is never the bottleneck between two ledgers. So it would always be the maximum performance achievable by those two ledgers. And Cactus would just not make a difference in that sense. Got it. Um, and then if you could comment on how Cactus compares to Rosetta. Uh, Rosetta. Yes. Yeah, so they're different in the sense that Rosetta is something that we plan on implementing in Cactus as in plan on supporting it. Rosetta, as far as I know, it's, it's a specification on how to connect uh, different wallets. So it's something that we would want to enable for you to use if you're using Cactus. Got it. Um, any other questions right now? Oh, also, Rama, did you want to also answer the performance question regarding Weaver? I have the my response oh. would be the same as yours. Uh, we, okay. as you say, we uh, we want the Weaver relay not to be a bottleneck, and uh, there is there's an effort ongoing. Uh, we have uh, with uh, we are aware of uh, with a grad student uh, who's trying to measure the performance of interoperability framework. So uh, we will see how that goes. But yeah, we don't have any published benchmark uh, numbers for Viva at this point. Got it. And then regarding the Rosetta incorporation, uh, when do you foresee that being completed? It is subject to prioritization. I, it, it will probably not be in the 1.0 release, but it may make it to the 2.0, which... I personally hope we will be able to get out in maybe three to six months after the 1.0. Got it. That's, that's not a promise. That's just my estimate. <laughs> Got it. All right. Any other questions? All right. All right. Um, I want to do a a benchmark myself. What are the recommendations? 
Sorry, can you repeat that? I want to do the uh, the benchmark myself. What should I do? Uh, what are the recommendations? Sorry, I'm not sure. How, I understand. How, would you, how would you go about benchmarking the, the frameworks? Uh, yes, by myself. Yeah, how would you go about benchmarking it yourself? Okay, if uh, possible. Yeah, I, I think at least for Weaver, you can. Uh, we have uh, documentations that help you get started. Uh, you can uh, spin up a couple of uh, minimal test networks, uh, two on Fabric, one on Corda. They're minimal in the sense that Fabric networks have a single peer, which is not representative at all, but at least it brings up a network that allows you to complete uh, an end-to-end -end, uh, protocol. Uh, you can run that network, and then you can uh, write any sort of a performance of performance benchmarking code on that. You can. Um, Right, use uh, any of the available load generators to drive uh, transactions. So the instructions show you exactly how to run an interoperation query. This is I'm talking about data sharing, which was our what we mainly started off with. We also have instructions for uh, doing uh, cross-network asset exchanges, that is using HTLC. So you can uh, follow the instructions for each of them, and then you'll have to write your own uh, test harness on top of that. You'll have to build a load generator, pump in a load according to whatever traffic pattern you want, and uh, write some additional code to uh, collect uh, statistics like throughput and latency and so on. Got it. Thank you. Um, is there any sample code to get started with Cactus, like a Hello World program? Oh. Yep, I just typed out the response. Got it. Got it. Um, and do you see some interoperability of asset exchange with public blockchains using Weaver, Cactus, or Beso? Yeah, so we are uh, we almost have uh, asset exchange going with, with where one uh, network is Hyperledger Bezu. Uh, we are doing some um, uh, last final refactoring on the code before we merge into main. Uh, but yeah, that. The Bezu side of it is uh, built on something, uh, it's built on the ERC20 libraries. So we're assuming that uh, any uh, fungible asset that is that you would like to exchange on a Bezu network in exchange for uh, some other asset on a, say another Bezu network or be it a fabric or a cordon network, you can do that. So, uh, just watch out that the Bezu support should be forthcoming quite soon. We already have fabric support for uh, these sounds of asset exchanges and uh, Corda is mostly done, um, or at least one version is already done. We are trying to refine it, but Bezu with ERC20 to, uh, based assets uh, is coming very soon. Got it. Um, I know we are a little bit over time. Um, so if there's any other questions, I would say, you know, feel free to reach out to um, Peter and Raman if, uh, there's nothing else here. Again, thank you both for, for volunteering to give this. Uh, very interesting. And thank you to the audience for uh, your questions. And we look forward to seeing you at the next meetup. Thanks again, both of you. Thank you for having okay. me. Thanks, everyone. All right. Thank you.